What's going on everyone? Today we're here with Virgil Roberts. Now he was the former head of Solar Records and we'll get to talking about that. And he's also an entertainment attorney and he has decided to join us today. Um, and it would be great to talk to him about a few things because you know some of the people that he was over were some great artists. So Virgil, thank you for joining us on the show today. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a, a pleasure to be, to be here with you today. All right, so Virgil, let, let's talk about just your beginnings. Um, yeah. Where did you grow up and what kind of values that your family instilled into you? Well, I grew up, you know, in the seat of the of the, the fire we've been hearing, hearing about. I grew up in Ventura, California. Ventura uh, is an agricultural town. Uh, my folks came to California. They were part of the great black migration. They were sharecroppers in Texas. They came to California as, as migrant farm workers, and they would alternate between working in San Joaquin Valley uh, in cotton fields in coastal California where they could pick lemons and, and oranges. Uh, lemons and oranges are winter fruits. They get ripe in the winter. And mm -hmm. you, you work cotton in the spring through the summer. Um, so, so my folks were, were hardworking people that instilled in us, you know, a sort of work ethic. Uh, they did not have an opportunity to be educated, uh, as was the case, I think, for many people who were, you know, um, sharecroppers, people who, who lived in rural areas. And so uh, they always wanted me and, and my brothers to get an education and, and they work hard to support our family. My father always had two or three jobs, never made very much money. I don't think he ever made uh, more than maybe $12,000 in his life in a, in a year. Um, wow. And um, so, you know, you know, so I grew up uh, without a lot of economic resources, though. Uh, I, never, I never thought we were poor, uh, though we were poor. I, I, I understand that now. But um, I used to think when I read about people having, you know, a meal where they'd have like a, a starch and a vegetable and meat, I just thought that's the way that white people ate because we would always just have one thing. You know, we'd have greens or we'd have a pot of black eyed peas or a pot of beans and that would be, that would be dinner. And, and most of the people I grew up with lived in the same circumstances. Um, as I got older and, and became better educated, I realized that we were we were poor people who were never hungry, and never wanted for love, um, and never and never lacked in motivation for my parents to to work hard and have a better life. Yeah, you guys were maybe poor financially, but you really wasn't poor when it came to the important things because you know you have people today who have all the food they can eat have all the material possessions they want, but yet they didn't have that, which you had about a family that's being together or, you know, the encouragement of uh, your parents or even just having two parents in a household. A lot of them, you know, especially in our community, we are suffering immensely because of that. I think that's right. You, you know, in some respects, you know, I still have family that live in, in rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, you know, we were, as black people, we're basically agrarian people. We were brought here, we were enslaved, we worked on uh, on farms and stuff. And then as people left and migrated to the north and we moved to cities, um, we lost some of that sense of community and, and familyhood that really nourished and supported us, you know, through all the years of slavery and, and Jim Crow. Um, and, you know, you can do things in a city where you're anonymous and you can't do in a small town where everybody knows who you are. Um, and so um, we, 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 really, we, we really lost uh, a lot as a people. If you think about uh, coming out of slavery when it was illegal for you to learn how to read and write, um, there were over 100 black colleges that got created and there was a time when we really celebrated knowledge and education. And somewhere along the line, we've gotten to the point where if you try and be educated, kids will say you're trying to act white as if 
being ignorant is being black and that's that's not the way it it was and that's not the way it should be well you know you mentioned to me before the show um the age range you're in so i could definitely pick your brain on this question yeah when did you see the change from being educated want to be educated because we see the pictures of you know this one iconic photo of this little girl and these two little boys they shoes you know got holes in them right um but yet they're still walking to school kids right. these days you tell them hey go go to school go walk to school um i'm not going to school i don't have no shoes yeah. so when did this happen this well changed? you know it, it's hard it's hard hard to say uh, and and sometimes I don't like to talk about it because I don't want people to think I'm a black conservative because I'm not. But um, th I th th there's a change that started really around the time that Johnson had the war on poverty. Mm -hmm. And what we began to do is we created a stronger social safety net. You know, when when I was a boy growing up, before we had such a strong safe, uh, social safety net, everybody I knew worked. They had mm -hmm. different jobs, you know, and um, it was expected that that that's what you had to do. You had to work, and so one of the things is motivation to go to school was so you you know so you could you could escape certain jobs. Uh, I certainly didn't want to be a, a cotton picker. I didn't want to work in the fields, um, and then my folks had a certain certain sense of of dignity, because when I was a boy, a lot of my friends, you know, they would do things like shine, shine shoes. Um, my folks would say, "No, I'm not going to let you shine shoes, and I'm not going to let you work on the trash truck." There was a there was a rubbish hauling service, so I did gardening work. I did uh, did other things, but there was a sense that you had to go out and you had to work and you had to figure out how to better yourself. Um, then came along the Great Society, and all of a sudden there were uh, lots of ways that you can make money without working, without being educated. Um, and I think it became almost like an opiate of the people. Um, and so there's a there's a a real fine line between making sure that you're providing people with the resources they need so they can feed their families and live and, and, and have a life and uh, robbing people of, of initiative and incentives to do for themselves. And, and so I think somewhere along in the, in the 60s, I began to sense that there was this change that was going to take place in our community. And, um, it, you know, it was in part a reaction from the powers that be to the growing militancy of, of black folks. You know, if you roll back history, um, we kind of went from a civil rights movement to a black power movement. And the black power movement really, I think, scared um, the powers that be. You know, in 1967, um, there were 107 race riots in America. Mm -hmm. And there was a sense that um, the black community was kind of an open rebellion. And I think a lot of what happened thereafter was to put money into the community to sort of buy off the, that, that anger and the sense that we weren't getting a, a fair shake. And that money that flowed into the community in, in um great society, anti-poverty programs, I think had the, the negative feedback effect that began to rob our community of incentives. It began to rob our community of, of a lot of the entrepreneurial impulses that we had. Um, and, you know, I think we're living out the consequences of, of some of that change in public policy. Uh, the other thing that, that, that happened during the 60s uh, that we're living out is the end of segregation. Uh, one of the net, one of the negative effects that segregation has created is it killed off a lot of black businesses. You know, it's, it's you mean strange. desegregation. Yeah. So, so for when we had it, we were were living in apartheid in American apartheid. 
if you wanted to get a life insurance policy and you were black, you had to go. You had to go to a black insurance company because mm-hmm. you could not get policies from white companies. If you wanted to get a, a mortgage for your house, you had to go to a black bank. Um, and so there was a huge amount of, of black business that was really created and in, and in fact sheltered by by segregation. So that you know everything from uh, black hotels to black banks to you know you name it, all the services that you need to have uh, were available in a in a black community. When we began to desegregate society, what uh, one of the real um, casualties of that were a lot of black enterprises, black insurance, like here in Los Angeles, we had Golden State Mutual Life Insurance. It's gone. Um, we used to have uh, uh, four black banks. Uh, essentially, you know, we're down. We're down to two. Yeah, it used to be that every young black person if you wanted to buy a house you want to buy a car you go to a black bank we don't do that anymore um, and so as a consequence a lot of the businesses that we used to have that served our communities a lot of the businesses that would be the first entry level employment for 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 young black folks and for black professionals we lost a lot of those in in the 60s and 70s as a result of, of desegregation. And then on top of what you're speaking about, um, the black family itself, um, we noticed after uh, the civil rights movement and desegregation, um, we see a lot of people, we see it definitely started with a lot of our brothers getting with uh, white women and now the the women, they, they're making a movement push for to be with white men. Um, was that anywhere close to like you see today back in that time period prior and was our family a lot closer then yeah uh, our families were our families were close because we had to be our communities Mm -hmm. were closer because we had to be Mm -hmm. you know um the the, as i said you you know i I don't want to i don't want to sound like i'm a a black racist but but one well, brother, the, hold on, brother. Black people can't be racist. I can go through <laughs> a reason, nine reasons why you can't be racist. But anyway, but, go ahead. But but, but you know that the, there was there was a period of time when you, if you were a black professional, you had to live in a black community mm-hmm. uh, because you couldn't you couldn't get a place in a white community. So what that meant was that. Uh, our lawyers, our doctors, the educated lived in the same community where the poor and uneducated lived. So I'll give you a, a, a really simple example. Like I live in uh, Baldwin Hills area of Los Angeles. We have a, uh, there's a YMCA, it's Crenshaw YMCA. Uh, and years ago, uh, my wife was on the board of the Crenshaw Y. And you know what Ys do? They have basketball leagues and football leagues and stuff, but they rely on uh, volunteer parents, usually men, to be the coaches, to be the referees, to run the leagues. So uh, there, there was a period of time beginning in the late 60s and 70s where basically most of the um, young black families of you know, young professional black families moved out of the black community, and all of a sudden the Crenshaw Y could no longer run basketball leagues and and flag football leagues because they didn't have enough fathers volunteering to be the coaches and the referees, um, and so that sort of brain drain out of black communities uh, continues across 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 the country where you have upper middle class blacks have left. And in many cases, working class, middle class black folks moved to the suburbs. And mm-hmm. so the result was that you had uh, the poorest of folks in our community uh, are the, were the ones that were left. And I think that really helped lead to the growth of a lot of gangs because, you know, when, when I was a boy growing up and you had black men who worked construction and stuff, the idea that there'd be some young kids who would be snatching purses from grandmothers, the men would go and stop that. Mm-hmm. Those men are no longer in the community. 
Um, and so a lot of the things that made our communities whole, we lost. I think that's a negative feedback effect of desegregation is that uh, if you go into most black communities today in most urban areas, what you find is they're, segre they're segregated by class. They're not, they're not like um, uh, an inclusive community where you have rich, middle class, and poor living together. You usually have just poor. The middle class and the rich have moved. So, so you said basically after the civil rights movement, we didn't have a uh, class in the black community. We just kind of together. But after that, then we, that's when we kind of started our own different class warfare, basically. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we, we have our own, own kind of class warfare. There, there are middle-class black people now that, you know, probably your age, who've never been to a housing project mm -hmm. and would be afraid to go. Um, in a bygone era, um, you know, when I was growing up, there was a lot of movement back and forth between, you know, affluent people and poor people because we lived in the same community with the same churches, went to the same schools. Doesn't happen now. Um, and so what it's done is it's really hard uh, to go and get middle class black professionals to come and be mentors for poor black kids because they don't know the kids, they don't know the community, and it's a, it's a commute from where they live. You know, what you tend to do is you tend to volunteer and make the communities where you live better. Right. So, so if your kids, you know, if you're gonna be involved with the school, the PTA, or some sort of parent group, it's gonna be at the school where your kids go. Well, the, the problem is that the people who have the most influence in, in our society whether it's political, financially, or otherwise, are those who are the most affluent and the best educated. And what has happened is our more affluent and better educated Black folks now live in white communities, and they're making those communities better and stronger. So let me ask you a question then. How can we fix that? Or can we not fix it since we have a great separation of class? I think I think the way we the, I think the way that we have to try and fix it is we have to begin to build this sense that we are one people. You, you know, I, I have an ongoing uh, debate with my wife about um, the culture of, of, of black people. What, what slavery did to us that it, that it did not do to any other immigrant group of folks is it erased our heritage and our sense of where we came from. And it took away what is an organizing principle that most ethnic groups have. Um, and, you know, without talking about other ethnic groups, let's talk about black people. If you are Nigerian and you come to America, so now you're a Nigerian American, you still have ties and roots back to other Nigerians in America. And if there's a crisis that takes place in Nigeria, all the Nigerian Americans will organize around the fact that they are Nigerian. They have, they have a history that goes back to their tribe, their, their homeland, their, their clothes, their food, their music, their gods, all those things you, unite them. Um, and, and I can remember several years ago when a hurricane struck Jamaica, all the Jamaicans in LA got together and did a fundraiser for Jamaica. Rich Jamaicans, poor Jamaicans, they had this sense of, of peoplehood. We lost that as, as African Americans. And as a consequence, for example, let's go back to our institutions. You will find like Chinese Americans, they'll go to a Chinese bank. Um, but African-Americans would just go to the bank that gives them the best deal. They'll go to the grocery store that gives them the best deal. There's no sense of, I'm an African-American, so I need to make sure that I support an African-American grocery store, or I support an African-American bank, or I support an African-American insurance company. But other ethnic groups, 
uh, because of that kind of uh, history and culture that they have, they support institutions in their community. They support everything from the schools they create, the banks they create, the insurance companies they create, and they will even pay a little bit more money to go and support those institutions because they recognize that if somebody comes here, they can go to one of those places and get a job. They can go to one of those places and get a loan. They can go to one of those places and find out where they can get a place to live. Um, and so we have really, um, when I was in college, I wrote a paper and said, um, the only real Americans are African Americans because what happened with us is our history and culture before America was purposely washed away. And because it was washed away, we usually, uh, our sense of heritage and culture begins at the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and for years, you know, as I grew up, if you ask people when I was a, a young man about going to Africa, nobody wanted to go to Africa, didn't want to know anything about Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the way in which we've been, we've been taught in, in, in our country, when, when we do a history of Black America, uh, we'll have something like the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. But there aren't any museums that talk about African kings and queens and the heritage of Africa, how it was the Africans who came up with the Arabic numeral system, that it was the Africans who were the first astronomers and stuff. So that, that, sort of, that sort of heritage and history we don't get. When our schools will get a history of Western civilization, you know, we learn about the Greeks, we learn about the Romans, we learn about the, the birth of the, of the Catholic Church and stuff. But we learn very little about where we came from other than slavery. Um, and so it makes it really hard for us to deal with what is, in, in my mind, it's almost a, a mental illness that, that was created by those who enslaved us to make us believe that we are less than than they. Um, and, and so what, what we aspire to be is we aspire to be like the people who enslaved us so that uh, a mark of success is to be deemed, is to be white-like, and it's deemed to be treated like you're one of the good old, the good old boys, the white folks. And so that's why, um, you, you know, it's almost like uh, we have nice neighborhoods uh, where black folks live in almost every, every community uh, in the country. But really wealthy black people don't want to live there. They want to live, they'd rather be in Beverly Hills and Baldwin Hills. Why? Because that means you've made it because now you're living in an affluent white area. Um, and, and so as, as I've often said to people when I talk to, to lawyers, if you got accepted to Harvard and Howard, you go to Harvard. Why? Because that's considered to be the best school. If we look at something like sports, where it's just running and jumping, every year they're all Americans, but you don't get all Americans from black colleges. Even though you'd be a great athlete, you got to be in a white college to be an all-American. Um, in the in the way in which we define success in in our society, if you're a great, like I work in the music business, mm -hmm. so when Michael Jackson was a little kid recording. Uh, out of Gary, Indiana from Motown, he was a black artist. When he started to sell a lot of records, he stopped being a black artist and became a pop artist. If you look at the nomenclature now, even Snoop Doggy Dog, who at one time was considered to be a gang, gang, uh, a gangster rapper from Compton, is now considered to be a pop artist. So what, what the society does is it defines greatness is always something that is not black. Um, and, and even in areas, like I say, even in things like athletics and music and stuff where where it should be okay 
um, the the culture does not allow it to be okay, and that keeps sending a subtle message back to us, our kids, and our community about if you're going to be great, you've got to be white like. Um, well. Well, the question I have about that, and, and, and I'm glad you brought up, you know, different mm -hmm. music artists, um, because you used to run a record label at one point right. in time. You know, you had some, you know, definitely people like, uh, I think I was reading here, Babyface, and um, you had groups like, of course, people in my age group, at least I, I was a kid when some of these uh, people was out, but right. uh, I know who they are, Midnight Star. I remember those that group. And Midnight Star, <laughs> Whispers, Lakeside, Shalimar. Uh, yeah, the deal. I, the deal. Um, yeah, I remember all those. Years. I definitely remember Shalimar and all. I remember the, those people, and they made great music. Yeah, I can honestly say they made great music. You guys were definitely choosing the right uh, uh, records to go with at that time period. So when you when you look at the artists you had back then, and then you even look at the artists Motown uh, had. Right. Um. How did the music industry change from just? black owned labels to now you hardly see any black owned labels unless they're attached to a white label. Yeah. Well, uh, there, well, there are almost no black owned labels. Now that's, that, that's part of the marketplace. Um, and you, you know, when I work at solar and, and through the sixties, you know, the, the apartheid that we had in America, even continued the record business, you know, um, it was virtually impossible for a black artist to be on the pop charts, regardless of how many records you sell. Um, uh, what technology has done with, with you know, the fact now you have BDS and uh, sound scans, so you can really, uh, really track the number of airplays and the amount of records that are sold. You start, you start to see a proliferation of black artists on, on all the charts, but in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s until we really got the technology um black artists would not be on the pop charts unless you unless you were like a michael jackson you just so many so so many records you, you could not be ignored um but we had groups you know like uh, groups like the whispers who had just a succession of maybe 10 platinum records in a row never made the top 10 of the pop charts always number one on r&b charts um when mtv started um, the idea was it was for white kids. They would not put black artists on MTV when it started. The first black artist to go on MTV was Michael Jackson. And the only reason they added him to the playlist is because Sony uh, said, if you don't play a Michael Jackson video, we're not going to give you any videos from any of our artists. So they put Michael Jackson on. Uh, the second black artist to go on MTV was our our, our group Shalimar. Shalimar was mm. was a was a huge group. I mean, we sold uh, in the mid '80s. We sold more Shalimar records in the UK than the Rolling Stones. Uh, wow, very huge artist, and um, so for that reason, uh, MTV added them because they had so many. Um, fans that were white that followed that followed them but our other artists you know like, like the whispers midnight star lakeside uh, we had real difficulty trying to get mtv to to play their videos you know it, it's it, it's like I, I don't know what it is even you look at that to this day right yeah. you have uh they just about then phased out r b if you listen to the radio you hardly hear you hardly hear any r b nothing people don't even discuss that but all these artists, whether they are hip hop artists or, or not, they all try to start making records that appeal to a Caucasian audience. But even though they are selling a lot of records, even though they have this big fan base. So in order for you to be successful, you have to, in the music business, cater to Caucasians? No. No other race of people outside your own? No, I, 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 think, that's, I think that's not necessarily true. I mean, what I think is, that the the music the music industry almost from time immemorial has really borrowed from the black culture you know one of the things that you find um and, and this is true when you go almost to any society those groups who are on the margins of society oftentimes are the ones 
that are the most creative. And what they create is what the society then later on uh, adapts and it becomes mainstream. And so the the marginal, the, 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 the non-mainstream groups in America it would be for the most part black folks. We have always come up with something new and different that then gets adopted by the majority group. And this goes all the way back to, you know, to the the Tin Pan Alley. You know, if you, if you go back and you look at almost every music trend um, that has taken place in America from the 1800s to the day, it started off usually in a black community that then got adopted by whites and then blacks moved on to something else. You know, so uh, whether it's jazz, you know, which is is a unique creation that came from black folks, that then the next thing you know, you had a, a lot of, of white musicians playing jazz, rock and roll. If you talk to the Beatles or the Rolling Stones and stuff, they will tell you that they were really studying the black blues artists. And so when you listen to what Mick Jagger does, um, you know, they were trying to figure out how can we be like Little Richard? How can we be like a black artist? And it came out differently because they, you know, they sang differently and stuff, but they were imitating black artists. Um, but there are more white people than are black people. And so if it's almost like, uh, it's always been the case, they'd like to have the culture without having the people. So mm. if you can, if you can sing like a, a black artist, if you can rap like a black artist, then you have an opportunity uh, to really become a big a big act because they're going to accept you because of the race thing. And, and you, you know, unfortunately, um, th there's still a lot of racism that's alive and, and well in, in, in our society. And um, it, it remains true that, that too many white people will only accept things from other white people. Uh, they like black music. They don't like black people. Hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. And that, that's always crazy for me because if I didn't like a group of people, I don't want nothing to do with what they got going on. I, I just It just doesn't make sense that you like them, you like their, their talent, you like the way they sing, the way they play football, basketball, uh, you like the way they rap. You like the way they dance. You like all that. And you know, every once in a while I've had a white person, um, be honest with me and tell me, say, look, white people really are jealous of black people. We want everything that you have. And sometimes we're mad that we don't have it. And, and I've had to, I've been told that. And I'm like, well, I appreciate the honesty. <laughs> I, 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 look, I, I think that should, you know, it's, you know, America is, is so, um, in order to maintain uh, hegemony over any group of people, you know, one group over another group, you have to somehow or another dehumanize them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you make them the other. Uh, and that justifies in your own mind some of the things you may do to that, that group of people because you justify it because they're not really people, they're not, they're not really like me. Um, and, and I think that's a human thing. You know, how, you know, it's like we watched the massacre of the Hutus and the Tutsis. Um, and to you and I who don't live in Central Africa, if we were to look at a Hutu and we look at a Tutsi, we could not tell the difference. Right. But white people could. I mean, remember, uh, one of the, the greatest, the greatest crimes against humanity was the Holocaust, where you had German white people burning up Jewish white people. And, you know, it was like, I, you know, I don't even know how you could, you, you know, you or I looking at um, it, somebody that was a German Christian and a German Jew, I think they look the same to us. Right. But, but within that context, there was an in-group and an out-group and once you define somebody as an outgroup, 
it justifies you doing really unbelievable, inhumane things. So I think that I think that's a um, a human characteristic. That the 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 difference between black and white is so stark that it really is. E it's even easier, if you will, because we can look like somebody that's white, but our skin color makes it clear that we're different. And that and and that couple with the um, the whole sort of um, ideology that allowed this country to create the institution of slavery uh, and to really use the enslaved people to create the the wealth that really helped make this country what it is. Um, you know, there was an immense amount of free labor that that was gotten from the enslaved people that lived in conditions that nobody else wanted to live in, but it led to not not just the wealth of the South, but it led to the wealth of the North um, because the um, you know if you, if you do kind of a uh, studied the economic history of America, the textile mills that created a lot of the wealth in the North, the shipping industry that really created almost all the wealth in New England, it wasn't just about whaling, uh, it was about the slave trade. And the ships that were engaged in doing that weren't built in the South, they were built in the shipyards of the North. Um, and there, there were slaves that created wealth throughout all the original 13 colonies in the first 13 states. Um, and, um, you know, the, most of the skilled labor in America, remember this is a country of immigrants. And a lot of the, a lot of the immigrants who, who came to this country, they were not necessarily the best artisans and stuff in the country from whence they came. And so in many instances, as people gain wealth here, they would still have to get things custom made in Europe and then shipped here at great expense. Well, ultimately, uh, they began to teach the slaves to become the skilled laborers of America. Um, and so, you know, one of the, one of the things that that happened when when the unions began to, to to come into existence part of what unions did is they excluded the skilled labor which was almost all black in america i don't know if you ever read you know w.e.b du bois like the philadelphia negro um but but it but it's worth reading because what 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 had happened that the best carpenters the the best milliners, the best chefs. You think of skilled labor. Well, who was that? They were blacks. They were the slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, if you remember. And now they've been replaced. Now, that, now they've been replaced with uh, Mexican people. That's right. Uh, and 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 um, the replacement came about because people like to have slave labor. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you can have. Uh, somebody who's worried about their immigrant status working for you, you can pay them less, you can threaten them in some cases, pay them pay them nothing. So, you, you know, I, I sort of sort of watch this uh, in 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 my own in, uh, from my own eyes. Let me put it that way. Um, you, you know, one of the great untold stories about about California, for example, is a lot of the farm work that was done in California was done by former sharecroppers from the South. That's how my folks got here. They would send mm -hmm. contractors to the South to get um, black uh, plantation workers like my parents who knew how to do cotton and they would entice them to come to California to work in the cotton fields. And let me tell you, if, if, you've ever done, if you've ever done farm work, it is the hardest work that there is. Nobody does that out of love of, of working, okay? And so, uh, when, but, but in the days when they did a lot, of, a lot of farm work and stuff, black men were not allowed in the union. 
uh, they didn't admit black men into the construction trade unions until um, World War II. But World War II came and there was a labor shortage. That's when they started to allow black men to do things like, like join unions. And so you had a mass exodus of black farm workers to like the shipyards in Oakland and Richmond and San Francisco to doing construction work in places like Los Angeles and elsewhere. And that's when my, my folks, my father stopped working in the fields and got a job as a laborer. Uh, and we see the same thing happening with Latino farm workers. They come to do farm work, but as soon as they get a chance to, to, to move up the, the ladder, if you will, to, to doing construction work, that's what they do. Uh, when I first started practicing law in Los Angeles, there there was a there was a janitors union that was uh, almost all black, almost all the janitors uh, in all the office buildings in Los Angeles were black. Uh, all the major D's at the major restaurants and stuff were black. Um, and uh, in fact, I used to have one of my cousins used to clean the office where I work and. Um, I remember I worked in Century City in a law firm and there were only like five black lawyers who worked for law firms uh, in, in, Century, in Century City. At night, there'd be nothing but black workers. Um, the, the office building owners broke the union by importing workers um, from, from south of the border who worked for, for lower wages um, in those buildings and eventually broke the, the, the Black Janitors Union. So it was sort of interesting to me, you know, you fast forward 30 years and there was a huge uh, movement of the Latino janitors to create a new union for janitors. And fortunately they were successful in creating that union. But you, you know, the-, the So, no, the not, to cut you off, not to cut you off. So what you're yeah. saying is, I'm listening to the history of how things are happening. Yeah. So what you're saying is um, immigration has really hurt the black community in the area of jobs. No, I, I wouldn't reach that conclusion. What I would say is immigration did take some jobs that black folks have. And what I would say is the one percenters that the folks really own America, they have always used uh, immigrants to break unions. You know, the, the first immigrants that they use of Blake unions were, were black workers. You know, if you go back and you study like uh, Carnegie and the steel mills and stuff, when the steel workers started trying to organize, they went to the South and brought black men up to work in the steel mills and stuff in, in the Midwest as a way of breaking the union. Um, so basically what you're saying is white men wanted, you know, to organize and white men, you know, their unions and they say, okay, well, forget you. We won't get these black ones. They'll, they'll take those jobs for literally nothing. That's right. Okay. That's but right. then the black people get scaled up. They got their unions and then they say, okay, well, let's bring these uh, immigrants in who don't have no papers and afraid to get deported. Right. And get them the job. That's correct. It's, oh. a, it's, it's a, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing cycle. And so, so, so poor people, people of color, you have to understand the game you're playing and don't fight each other. You fight the people who are trying to, to pitch you against each other. And that has been the, the, the success of, of, of the, those who rule America. They've always pitted poor people against each other while they continue to make all the money. Yeah, that's that's exactly how white supremacy works. I mean, it just nothing but evil. Even when you could talk about the music industry, you talk about immigration, you talk about desegregation. And that's why that's why my fight is against white supremacy because I know how evil it is. It's not for non-white people. Period. It's only for one group of people to have everything and oppress. You know those who are uh, non-white. So, um, and so now with that with that said. Um, Virgil, I definitely thank you for joining us today on the show, giving us some great knowledge, definitely a lot of knowledge for history that we in the black community need to know because some of us don't know how we got to where we're at. They're just looking at our condition today. 
and they're not seeing that, okay, it, it was a start to all this. So I definitely appreciate you uh, letting us know that. Is there any kind of way that people could contact you if they want to ask you some questions um, about maybe something you said and to get clarification because they want to learn? Yeah, sure. The, you, you know, what, what people can do, I, you know, I hate to say, but but they, they can they can email me. Um, and, you, you know, I, I eventually do answer my emails. My email is V for verb, V Roberts at BobRobLaw.com. It's V Roberts at BobRobLaw.com. So uh, people can email me questions comments and uh and, and given the the time that i have i'd be happy to try and respond okay so v robbers at bob rob law.com correct our law firm okay. bob is our law firm is bob and roberts so the v is okay. so it's v roberts so it's like virgil roberts but it's v yes, roberts sir. at bob rob law.com okay so if anyone has any questions um you could email we'll put that in the pinned comment and that way you could uh email him if you have any questions because he definitely has a lot of knowledge for us so virgil thank you for joining us on the show today you have a, a great day out there in california and um you know just stay safe with all the fires and mudslides i'm gonna try to uh and, and I, I wish you a, a a happy and prosperous 2018. all right you too brother all right keep doing what you're doing all right, we sure will. Okay.